Hello and welcome to another edition of Sports Talk Philadelphia here on LaSalle TV. I'm your host, Josh Abrams. Today's show, we're going to talk about the Sixers and the Flyers as they get into the final stretch of their regular season. Sixers are looking good, Flyers not so much. We're going to have that and all much more after this intro. Oh, this you crazy mother... Welcome to Sports Talk Philly. We're going to start off today's show with our headline section. Before we do that, I must introduce the panel today. Tyler Small and Sam Brown, our regulars, join us to start off with the headlines. Uh, and the first headline for today is opening day. That is right. The Phillies, the 2019 Phillies, finally stepped foot on the field, led by Gabe Kapler in his second year as manager. Uh, opening up, Aaron Nola took, taking the mound against the Braves' Julio Tehran. And uh, we're anticipating matchups like this for the rest of the year. We're going to see the, this Braves team a lot. Uh, but let's talk about the Phillies. We we've, we've did our preview show talking about how we feel about them, but, you know, it's finally here. Uh, how do you guys feel? What are you, what are you, what's going through your guys' heads as we open up the season? Purely excitement. I'm so excited the season's here, and finally all the speculation of what could be of this lineup are finally going to start coming true. You see it already with Andrew McCutcheon today. And hopefully we'll see it from all the new guys coming up, especially with how good the numbers have been from, let's say, Harper in the NLE, especially off of Julio Tehran and other pitchers because the Braves are going to be the number one competition this season. So it's just very exciting to see what can finally come from what we've talked about for so long. Yes, a very nice day for the city indeed. Just to see the stadium packed during the day, to see just a, a star-studded lineup that this team has worked very hard to build. And... It'd be a great, it'd just be a great pleasure to see everything materialize, everything that this team has worked for all coming together this year. It's, I think it's pretty safe to say that this is the most highly anticipated opening day since maybe 2012, even, even when we didn't make the playoffs that year. I mean, the, looking at the lineup from 2017, or 2018 rather, to this year, you know, there's still a couple of the same guys in there like Cesar Dubo and, uh, and Michael Franco. But then you add these new guys in that we traded for or signed, and all of a sudden we're, we're, uh, we're at least a division contending team. So, you know, I guess, uh, you know, what, what signing, what, what new player or, or returning player are you guys looking to step up the most? I'm looking for JT Real Muto to have a big year. He's been regarded as the best catcher in baseball, and now that he's playing in a smaller, bar, smaller ballpark, playing 100 plus games. In the season, his offensive numbers are going to be much higher than they, than they were uh, a year ago when he played with the Miami Marlins. And now that he actually has uh, more weapons around him to get the job done on offense and defense, he's due for a breakout year. And that's a good point. You bring that up. He really struggled 100 points lower average-wise in Marlins Park. So it's definitely going to see a more hitter-friendly park in Citizens Bank. But I'd say the most is coming out of the bullpen, David Robertson. I expect him to have a great year. He really didn't have a defined role with the Yankees. He was more of like a seventh, eighth inning guy. Sometimes he closed, sometimes he came in for middle relief. But he is a proven closer who can really hammer down the rotation, which could struggle on days, as we know. So as long as we start getting Arietta or Velasquez to be the pitchers they're supposed to be, along with Nola, then we should have a steady horse in the bullpen. Sure, and, I, and I, re I agree with your guys' picks. I mean, really, with the amount of additions that we made this offseason, it's kind of hard to pick just one person. I would really go with Segur just because of our, our infield struggles, especially at shortstop. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the team obviously improved, and we're really looking forward to it. Uh, the last headline we're going to talk about before we move on to Flyers talk is the Eagles uh, still being in play for Jay Ajayi. Now, does this really, is this as important as we think? Maybe, maybe so, maybe not. I think it's really important just because of our running back situation right now. I'm not going to trust that Josh Jacobs is going to be available at that 25th overall pick. So I really think that in maybe some ways more than others, getting Ajayi back just for, uh, um, you know, just like for safety reasons, just to have a good established back back there might be the thing to do. What do you guys think? 
I think whether with him or because I, I haven't seen much on Jacobs. I've really been eye popping off the draft charts. So I wouldn't be putting our whole future in him. So I think Ajayi is a proven back that we have won with and we had success with and just unfortunate to see him go last season. But he's definitely someone that could make or break the NFC East this year for the Eagles. And the fact that if they don't have this running game, they just won't be able to beat the talented Cowboys who have probably one of the best running backs in the NFL right now. So I think it's huge. What do you think, Zach? And it's just a very desperate situation that they need to address much sooner rather than later because he signs somewhere else. There's not really a whole lot of decent running back free agents that are going to be available to choose from. I think I heard the best uh, running back after a Ajayi that's available would be Isaiah Crowell. Is that someone the Eagles really want on their team if they're going to be competing again this year? So you it might just have to sign Jay Ajayi out of desperation. And the point with that is whether it was Le'Veon Bell or even a Mark Ingram that you saw so many big names in this free agency, then they didn't get any of them. So that's a struggle. Yeah, it, it really is a shame to see the running back situation right now. I'd love to see him figure it out. Uh, but we're going to move on to the Flyers now. And unfortunately, <clears throat> it, the Flyers are really in the dumps right now. They are at 92 points after their most recent win over uh, Toronto, which is very impressive within itself, but it may be too little too late. Uh, we are, or excuse me, we, ha we only have 82 points right now. The most amount of points we can get is 92 because we only have five games left. Uh, and I think really for the last week or two, the Flyers were in a situation where if they lost a game, more likely than not, their playoff chances were, were done. Uh, mm -hmm. They've lost a couple games recently, and now they're really like, they're on the thinnest uh, leash right now ever mm -hmm. that you can possibly get at because if they, they – if they drop one more point, they're done. So, Sam, uh, where, where do you think – what do you think has gone wrong in this last stretch? It's been a really rough season for the Flyers, but is there anything yeah. that stood out to you? They didn't do their normal uh, turnaround at the end of the season to, very, to sneak into that very last spot. And at this point, I know they want to make the playoffs, but it's a lost cause at this point. Uh, there's no way that they're going to even – maybe even win a game should they make the playoffs, just given the competition that they'll be facing in Tampa and Boston and Pittsburgh and Toronto. Just making the playoffs would be a useless gesture, and it's better that they miss the playoffs from going forward. Now, Tyler, you were, you yeah. were, you've yeah. been saying that for a while now. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and of course I'm not happy to see them miss the playoffs this year, but um, this last stretch of games was obviously pretty much like a playoff scenario like the Eagles had this season. And... Um, you look at some of the losses they had, loss of the Capitals, just their third and fourth line really struggled in those games, letting up some goals from guys on the Capitals I've never even heard of before. Um, Islanders is a game they have to have. They dropped that one. They barely won the other night against the Maple Leafs off pretty much a goaltending error from Anderson. So I think it is best for the future. I think they can start not necessarily rebuilding, keeping some of their more pieces because I think they saw more out of just Giroux and just getting rid of anyone else. Now that they have like hearts or they've seen like now, out of nowhere, Knight has like four points in the last two games, I think, or something. So he's just an example of somebody that's really been stepping up. So it's just evaluation time and letting some of the young guys get more ice. Yeah. It's time to call it a season, to be honest. Just get the better draft, draft position, sign the big players that you need, be in better position to, to just have a better season next year. They might have to trade out of that draft because yeah. they're in that awful middle ground almost yeah, where it's, yeah. they're not good enough for a playoff team, but they're not low enough to get some – higher name draft picks, so it'll be interesting to see what they do. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I would really like to give a lot of credit to Scott Gordon. I mean, I, I'm mm -hmm. almost positive that when he took over this team, the Flyers at some point in time had, had uh, the worst record in the NHL. They were the worst team in hockey. It was really, really difficult to watch them, and then this guy comes in, and at, so, at one point in time, we're only five or five, four points out of a Mm -hmm. out of a playoff spot. It's, it's, very, it's a very tough task for any coach to do what Scott Gordon did, especially trying to get this team into the playoffs. Um, but what do you guys make of Gordon's short tenure so far? And do you think he has a spot in this organization for a while? Well, if Gordon was initially only brought up here as an interim base, on an interim basis, he's done a very good job at potentially recruiting um, Joel Quinville, one of the most winningest coaches in NHL history. And I think he's made a very good impression on some pr prospective, more experienced coaches to come in and take over this team. Mm -hmm. uh, he's really turned. He, at, 
just given that they're not in great position right now, he's really turned a garbage season mm -hmm. into something a little less so than that. Yeah, and it definitely, it's tough for any coach to just come in halfway through a year, go into a style that really isn't your own or try and implement your style, which is tough for an organization. Even if they are struggling, it's tough for an organization to go around a new system halfway through the year. So I think it really is impressive what he did. I think that it's something that we can look forward to in the future and just, just learning player by player, just learning what new style will work because obviously the old one has not. Right, yeah, and, and you know, Dave Haxtell's system was really just, yeah. a, it, was, it was a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, Gordon came in, I, I, it, it seemed like he, he knows what he's doing. Mm. Uh, I'm hoping that just solely based off of what he did once he got here, that we can at least give him one or two more, more shots he's at, a, it, yeah. at, at the coaching spot. Um, so I guess an, another thing we should talk about is, you know, we're, we're obviously not going to make the playoffs, but there's positives to the season. Uh, is there any player that stands out to you guys that, that you know, you, you are impressed with how he did this season and you expect him to do that or much more uh, next season? I've said it throughout the season. Sean Couturier has been my guy. He's greatly improved onto where he was, from where he was only two seasons ago, and now he's at his career high in goals with 32, and he's well on his way to uh, passing his career high in points, and he's just done an excellent job uh, being the veteran presence that this team needs to guide the young players, and he's putting up numbers. To He's making his contributions. He's done his role, and I would love to just see him uh, have more of an accelerated role and keep up the great work. Mine's going to be the other one that was just on that graphic card or heart. I, I, I was calling for him at the beginning of the season, and now I've seen him, and he's blown me away. Because even win or loss, he's been consistent with the same 35 to 40 saves a game. He really has had to work every game in net and um, had one little stretch with injuries, but it doesn't seem like anything that should be bad long term. I've have been blown away by him and his athleticism in between the poles. So if the Flyers were to somehow make the playoffs, they would play the Tampa Bay Lightning. And for the last couple of years, dating back to 2015, when they got to the Stanley Cup and lost to the Blackhawks that year, the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning have been the most impressive regular season team in the NHL the past couple of years. Um, you know, this, we're kind of straying away from talking about the Flyers a little bit because I want to know what you guys think about the Lightning this year. They're, they won the President's Trophy again. They're the best team mm -hmm. in hockey right now. But do you think they have what it takes this year to finally get over the hump and win a Stanley Cup? I do. I definitely. This is the best Tampa Bay Lightning team I've ever seen. And although it just has been a recent stretch where you've said that they've come to the top of the ranking boards, but they had the biggest offseason move this season, and they have capitalized off of it. It doesn't make Islander fans very happy to see that. And he got quite a recognition when he came back. But... Um, I think that they are going to have a very long playoff stretch. Whether they win it or not, I'm not too sure, but they'll definitely be fine. What yeah, do you think, Sam? This is such a hungry uh, Tampa Bay Lightning team that's just shown, just shown drive and just resilience all throughout the season. And they have a very hungry captain in Steven Stamkos who's just mm -hmm. tired of having the reputation of being the playoff choker. They have some excellent goaltending in Andre Vasilevsky. Mm -hmm. They have some of the best defense in the league. And all around, they're just, they're just the most complete team in the National Hockey League. And they are, at, my, at this point, they are my pick to win the Stanley Cup. Last season, it was Ovechkin being the choker that finally pulled through. And yeah. now it's going to be Stamkos. Yeah, I mean, it would, it would be definitely nice to see some variety. That's why hockey is a great sport, because you never know. You really don't know who's, who's going to win it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk some Sixers. So stay tuned. Kylie loves to an egg. An egg? An egg. How does someone like, how does a Jenner lose to an egg? Who there is to an egg? You know, there is a show for that. It's called Backstage Pass. Do you see the new library point? No, I haven't. Yeah, doing stuff in the library. Huh. In the library? Yeah. The new library. You know, there is a show for that called LTV News where the action never stops. I wonder how the basketball team is. You know, there is a show for that called Sports Live. So are you a Carson Wentz or Nick Foles guy? I'm working with Nate Sutton. Oh, really? Interesting. wonder where we can hear about Philly sports. You know, there's a show for that called Sports Soft Philadelphia. Do you like Family Feud? Uh, yeah. Do you, like, uh, do you like all shows like that? Yeah. I wonder if LaSalle has a show like that. That'd be kind of cool. 
There is a show for that called Q&A. I really wish that we could just like display our talents. Yeah, me too. There is a show for that called Explorers Got Talent. All this and more on LaSalle TV. Welcome back to Sports Talk Philly. Sam Brown steps off. Jake Kopstick and Dave Roberts join us to talk Sixers. And, uh, you know, it's been an interesting last couple of weeks. So last week we did a whole Phillies preview, so we didn't get a chance to talk anything other than Phillies. Um, at that point last week, guys, I had been feeling a whole lot better about the Sixers team. We had finally uh, uh, plummeted, in, or not plummeted, we had skyrocketed into third place. Everything, everything seems pretty good. We had we got a pretty easy schedule coming up, and that's something we can talk about later in in this segment. But we've lost the last two games to the Magic and the Hawks. After beating the Bucks and the Celtics, <laughs> and the Celtics we couldn't beat to save our lives. So yeah. I mean, you know, I guess or am I am I freaking out too much about these last two games? Yeah, <laughs> I I, I, did, I still feel great about the 76ers because if you really look at it, um, they just ran into a Trey Young that's just fighting for. Only thing that the only harbor that they're going to get this year is the right. MVP trophy, but he's not getting it from Luca. So he just got. You mean rookie of the year? Rookie of the year. Yeah, yeah right, me. right. And um, and the Magic. I'm going to get into this later, but they were without Ben Simmons, and they the offense just looked so slow without him. It looks like so discombobulated. I love T.J. McConnell, but he can't run it the same way that Simmons can. So those two losses, I think you more need to look at this Celtics win because that was huge. Yeah, I think you're overreacting just just a little bit, just a little bit. I mean, I was so glad that they finally beat the Celtics because it feels like they haven't done that in eons. But, you know, Trey, I think really Trey Young has kind of wrestled away the Rookie of the Year trophy from Don, from Luka. He's, really? he's tore it up since the All-Star break. He has. He's on fire. That's still, I mean, it still doesn't mean they, they, they should have lost them the other night. No, no, <laughs> not at all. You know, I mean, it's a shame Simmons misses the game. They lose to the Magic. I believe mm. the Magic are kind of like firmly in the playoff race right yeah, now. Yeah, they're in 18 so now, yeah. That hasn't happened for a while. So, hey, I mean, we'll, we'll throw those two away. I mean, yeah. hey, call them throwaway games. We beat the Celtics, so at least we got that. Mm. Are you going to tell him to calm down down there or what? I mean, you can get angry <laughs> if you want to. I, I can't control you. But, yeah, you know, you're, you're a little too antsy about it. But, you, you know, I mean, losses happen. We've seen our, us lose to some really bad teams before just because that's just what the Sixers do this season for some reason. But, I mean, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll be fine. We're the third seed. We, only have, we can only go up from here. We're really focused on the playoffs, honestly, with uh. the first round. So, I wouldn't pull you back on that, though, because there still is a chance it can go down to a five seed because of how close That's it is true. in the middle. So, I mean, as long as we can end on a winning streak, then I'll be fine and throw those losses away, but I can't get too comfortable. I mean, I think the, the, the big thing is that we need to keep the three seed because, no, yeah. I mean, it's going to be it's, it's gonna be very difficult right now to get that second seed from Toronto. I think we're four and a half games back with about seven or eight games left to play. So, Toronto would have to go four and three. We would have to win out. Highly unlikely. But the three mm -hmm. seed is fine because, you know, Boston's not number two again this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, wouldn't, we wouldn't play them in the second round if we are to do what we're expecting to do. Um, I guess a question I'll ask you guys is, you know, we, we have the potential to play either the Nets or the Pistons in the first round. No, I mean, neither of these teams really scare me, but is there a team that you would prefer to play in the oh, first round? Pistons by a long shot, I think. Why is that? Um, well, I would love to see the Embiid – Drummond matchup once again because Dr Embiid does have a big presence against Drummond. Yeah. And I, D'Angelo Russell and these Nets have looked very scary to me lately. Um, they have Chris LeVert who's been playing great off the bench. They have um, 
Spencer Dinwiddie, and they have um, Jared Joe Allen. Harris. <laughs> Joe, it's a three-point chance. Don't so forget about Con- Jared they Allen, have, too. Yes. They have Jared a Allen. lot of silent weapons that are – and they're a hot team right now. They're scary. Yeah, so true. I would want to see the Pistons first round. I 100% agree with Tyler. I don't want to see the Nets. They're, they're on fire right now. The mm-hmm. Pistons, they don't really scare me. We shut down Blake Griffin. You, know, you already yeah. know Embiid is going to eliminate Drummond from the game. No one else on that team really scares me. No, I'm, no. Not, I'm not intimidated by anybody. I think we match up very well with them, and I really think this could be a four or five game series if we end up seeing Detroit. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I feel like if it goes either way, it's going to be a six game series. I, I, that's just how I feel the Sixers are in the, <laughs> in the first round. Like, we can yeah. easily beat, the, beat a team, but we just go to six teams anyway. So I'm not scared of either team. I'm just like, just like play how you know how to play, and we, will, we can play four games. <laughs> Yeah. Or just do what you have to do, and we end up having six games. So, Well, I guess, I mean, you know, we talk about – get we're talking about the playoffs right now. We still have a little bit of regular season to go. The schedule is really easy, though. I mean, we're, the, the team's 47 and 27, mm-hmm. you know, 20 games above 500. We basically have the third, the third seed on lock after beating Indiana. Um, you know, I, I, you know I, maybe I am overreacting a little. This team, <laughs> this team does look really good. Um, I, I think it's safe to say Embiid is, I mean, I know Hard, Harden's insane, Giannis is doing his thing in Milwaukee, but Embiid has got to be up there in the MVP votes. I mean, he deserves to be a finalist, like, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah he's definitely going to get votes this year. There's no mm-hmm. way you, he can't get votes this year. I mean, he's honestly, well, like I said up there, he's the best big man in the league, I believe. Like, without him on the floor, we look really, we look really bad. And, um, you know, when he goes up against these other uh, big guys, this year, he's been a little iffy this year, but, like, he made a really big point in, uh, in the Bucks game. He made a really big point in the Celtics game. So I feel like if he doesn't get a single vote in the MVP race, then that's, that's, that's going to be very well, head-scratching. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So as you just show his athleticism coming off the injury, he yeah. had a couple weeks off. But um, I think I see it 100% in the last defensive play for the Sixers against the Celtics. That Kyrie Irving drive where he stayed with him, blocked him, and yeah. then out-rebounded him on the same jump. I thought that was huge. I thought that was a game stealer for them over their – Obviously, their number one rival. So I think that he should be a lock for it because the numbers back it. Yeah, I have to agree with them. It's almost like when I see Embiid throw up, you know, 25 and 15, that's just like another night at the office for him. It's like a quiet, that's great a bad game night for him. For him. Yeah, yeah, that might even be a bad <laughs> night for him. Like the numbers, Scoring the wise, impact. Yeah. I mean, he's clearly, I think, especially watching the team this year, I can confidently say he's easily the team's best player mm-hmm. and probably most important as well. I mean, he's the engine that makes this team run. Yeah, absolutely. No stopping him. Yeah. It's, it's pretty obvious at, the, at that point. Uh, another important player that I want to talk about real quick before we move on to our stars is someone who's been struggling a little bit. He's, he's, playing, he's played 20 games with us so far. He was scoring 20-plus almost every night. But Tobias Harris, he's been a little bit of a slump. Hmm. Uh, you see on the graphic there, he's, he's only scored, he scored less than 20 points in six out of his last eight games. I mean, this has just got to be a regular slump, right? I mean, Tobias is a good player. Every good player is going to have a bad stretch of games. This doesn't concern you guys at all, does it? You know, I'd rather have this slump right now than in the playoffs. So, I mean, that's mm-hmm. where I feel like we, that's where I should, like, we should focus at. Like, I'd rather him do very, really bad at the end of the season and just tone, like, you know, kick it up in the playoffs because it's more important. And, like, mm-hmm. you're very, like, he's a key player to this team. And I feel like he, if he knows what to do in these situations, um, like, in the playoffs, like, game four, game five, maybe, yeah. then he should be fine. Yeah, I, I like it timing-wise that it's not too late, and I also like that it's not too early. Because if you were to see this right when he became a 76er, you would say it's a difference of playing style. Right. And you would worry about that he's not going to fit well or gel well with the team. But the fact that it's now, it's just an obvious shooting slump. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to agree with them. It, it's not really a big deal to me. They have some games left against some not-so-great opponents. Mm-hmm. So in the event that... You know, they, they lock up a seed, they can't move up, they can't move down. Maybe you sit some of your stars, but if he's still slumping, I mean, hey, give him all the reps you can give him. Yeah, yeah. that's a good, that's a good point. Time. That's, that's yeah, a good point. Because yeah. I don't know, I mean, the, it's not, a lot of teams have clinched it, have yeah. clinched playoff yeah. spots. I would like to see that situation where we get into the third seed and can't go anywhere else. Yeah. Like, that, that would be pretty fitting for all of us. Definitely. Uh, so we're going to move on to our stars of the month. Tyler, let's start with you. You have Ben Simmons. Why is he your star? I think that it just became evident, and I'll say it again in this magic loss. The offense just comp- – the offense can't move without him. It's obvious that Embiid is the best player on the team, but Simmons makes them a team. His 12 assists a game make them a team. His um, – just his knowledge of the court, his great court vision, and it's just way to distribute, rebound, and attack when he has to. It's, I'd still love for him to learn jump shot, but so far he's still doing perfectly fine without it. If you look at it, two of the most – the greatest offensive weapons in the NBA right now, him and Giannis can't even shoot. So it's kind of nice to see that everyone can't shoot. 
All right, Jake, let's go to you. You're going to go to college basketball and talk about number one overall pick, Zion. Yeah, so I've been a Duke fan all my life and seeing him play just it makes me so happy because we win a lot of games because we have Zion and a lot of teams don't. He comes back from injury, Duke goes 5-0, and scores 30 points twice, three double-doubles. The first round game against North Dakota makes three quarters of a shot, makes 75% from the field. He, he's crazy, and he is the key to Duke winning. He could, you know, any other guy I feel like could go out on that team, it would still be a big blow. But as long as Duke has Zion, they're definitely the best position to win the championship right now. All right, Dave, uh, you, your star was Jimmy Butler, but you want to talk about the, the whole team. It's the whole team, Of course team, I do. Right? I, I want to talk about just what they call the death lineup. We look at the starters of the Sixers. It says 7-5 to five in March, but if you actually take into account all the, like those five guys starting each game, they're 7-1. and one. And that one game they lost is because that was the first game they ever played with each other. So those seven games, when they were on fire, they played some of the best basketball that you could see in the NBA this year, I think. And it's really amazing because like, this is the perfect time as a Sixers fan and as an NBA fan to just be excited about, like, you know, just the playoffs itself, the finals, like, and even beyond, like, who can we keep, who, who's not going to stay here? It's, I just love these guys. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard not to. It, it, they do look really good right now. Um, all right, so my star of the month is somebody who you really wouldn't expect to. He's leading, he's leading the pinstripes into his second managerial season, and that, of course, is Gabe Kapler. So why is Gabe Kapler my star of the month, even though that today is, is the day that they open their season? Well, because at spring training, when you get fans that come down to Florida, they're usually dedicated fans. Florida's a, a pretty long trip from Philly. Well, one of the fans that Gabe Kapler, was, that Gabe Kapler met or was mentioned of uh, while he was down in spring training was a guy named Matt Vassar. Now, Matt was a, is, was a native of CIO, New Jersey. He was one of 157 passengers killed on the Ethiopian Airlines uh, this past year. And Matt was on his way to Kenya for the United Nations Environment Assembly, and he was passionate about getting air and water filters to underprivileged communities, especially in Africa and Port Al Prince, Haiti, where the earthquake happened this decade. Uh, th really, the reason why I'm doing this is because baseball, or what, what Matt was doing was bigger than baseball, and what Gabe wants is for us to kind of show that love to Matt and that cause, just the way Matt showed love to the Phillies. So that's going to wrap it up for today's show. We thank you guys for tuning in. You can catch us on social media at Twitter, at Sports Talk LTV. Find us on YouTube on our LaSalle TV page. Look us up on Facebook or LaSalle.edu slash LaSalle TV. Once again, thank you all for tuning in. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.